Let's turn again to 2 Kings chapter 15. And my text is from verse 16 downwards. We'll see how far we get as the Lord directs. But the title of this message is The Decline and Death of a Nation. Whenever the scriptures speak of apostasy, it just doesn't happen overnight. There is a decline, and even as we saw with Hosea and the people, they were unaware. Even as they aged that gray hair in their false worship, and they, in their minds, were thinking, well, we've endured to this point, yet all the while, it was a decline that would ultimately lead to death and destruction. And that's an apt description of sinners who are left to themselves, whether it be a nation or whether it be even a congregation. Unaware, this is why Paul was so vehement in warning those congregations and churches in his day, and the Lord through the Apostle John warning those congregations in the book of Revelation. It's subtle. I liken it to somebody that has cancer in their body and they're totally unaware. We've all known some people like that and all of a sudden you get the report that they've been diagnosed with a lethal type of cancer and have very few days or weeks to live. And so you always ask the question, well, were they aware of this? No, they went in just for a regular checkup and the doctor discovered it. And all the while, that sense of death is in that body. That's an apt description of a nation or of sinners that think that somehow they're living a life pleasing unto God, and yet God has purposed their destruction. It's subtle, and that's why it's deceptive. They enter in, these from the outside, false preachers, and subtly they turn the people away. And so that's what we have here as we read some more on these kings that the Lord is raising up. And we've been studying this line of kings. I have in my mind on one side, the kings of Israel, which are the 10 tribes. And then on the other side, we've got the kings of Judah, which was the tribe that didn't follow after Jeroboam into idolatry in Samaria. But when you study, even though for a while they're parallel, suddenly now this line, and that's what we're studying here of these kings that we've been looking at, whether it's Menahem, the one we're going to begin with tonight, or Shalom that we saw last time. These are all these kings, or Zechariah, one the prophet, but these were kings that God had purposed for destruction. He kept raising them up, and as we saw, their, their times were limited. One we saw there, Shalom, he, he reigned for one month, and uh, then he was slain. The Lord removed him, some for longer times, but even that can fool people because they think, well, the longer I live, the more the Lord must be blessed. Now, that's just long enough time. That's how you get petrified rock. It's a fallen branch or whatever that sits there and corrupt and decomposes, and then all of a sudden, the longer it's there, suddenly it's, it's like a petrified rock. That's a pretty good description of sinners. And so I want us to consider here as we look at these, we're going to begin with verse 16, because we saw Shalom last time whereby, again, each of these was slain at the time of thinking that somehow they were securing their power, being raised up, then there was conspiracy, and they were slain. Some by their very trusted friends, the ones that they trusted in, that's how deceived they were. And so here in verse 16, after Shalom, we read that in verse 15, the rest of the acts of Shalom, and his conspiracy which he made, behold, they are written in the book of 
the chronicles of the kings of Israel. So now Menahem smote Tifsah and all that were therein and the coasts thereof from Terza because they opened not to him. You can see each one of these endeavoring or attempting to subdue the land unto their own power. And yet God was purposing all of this for his glory in defeating these enemies. But here it was because they opened not to him. In other words, these and these surrounding areas would not submit to his reign. And so therefore he went to battle against them. Therefore he smote it and all the women therein that were with child, he ripped up. It sounds pretty drastic, but even that the Lord purposed. A lot of people think that even children are somehow innocent up to a certain age. But when it comes to God's holiness, and here's by representation, that these women and children that were as much caught up because of their representatives in the idolatry of the day that the Lord purposed that they be destroyed right along with their mothers. I know people just don't understand a God like this. They, they think it's somehow safe for their children to be in church somewhere. How many times we've heard that? Just, just make sure that you've got your children in church every Sunday and the Lord's gonna bless. Well, if they're not sitting under the gospel, if they're not the Lord's, if the Lord has not chosen them, then they are just as guilty in their sin as their parents that they follow. And they grow up hardened in that religion. How many people do you talk to that made some kind of profession in some backyard child evangelism so-called club and boy, that's what they hold to till death do them part and it never parts. They're not going to ever relinquish that profession. And in so doing, being hardened, they suffer the same condemnation as anybody else that's left to themselves. So you can see here, Menahem was attempting or endeavoring to shore up his power like people do today. It's not for glory to God, but it's for glory to themselves. And so in the ninth and 13th year of Azariah, you see, here's the comparison. He's, Menahem here is with the, of the kings of Israel, that is of the 10 tribes of the north, but alongside parallel, this is the nine and 30th year, the 39th year of Azariah. Remember Azariah is Uzziah. You, you say, well, how come he keeps being mentioned along with all these others? Like we saw in verse 13, Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the nine and 30th year of Uzziah. So it's still the 39th year, and yet we're going through another transition. Well, it's because the Lord purposed that Uzziah reigned for 52 years. So all the while the Lord was sustaining Uzziah's reign over Judah, two tribes of the south, Judah and Benjamin, here these others, the Lord was turning them over one after another. It doesn't mean that Judah was any better. You know, I remind us that the only reason God preserved Judah was because that was the lineage from which Christ should come. It was for Christ's sake, not for anything in them, as we're going to see later on. First, the Lord took the ten tribes of the north into captivity, and destroyed them. They are no more. And then it wasn't a hundred years later, he took Judah into captivity. The 10 tribes of the north were taken into captivity by the Assyrians and the tribes of Judah and Benjamin were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Those two nations still exist today. Babylon would be what we know as Iraq. And Assyria, we've heard of the Syrians. Well, they were the old Persians. 
And so these were nations that were idolatrous nations. And the Lord, in essence, was saying to these, you like idolatry? You like that sort of lifestyle? Here, let me, let me take you out and let you serve under these idolatrous nations until you, you literally die under their hand. But yet there's mercy with the Lord. That's what I want us to see. There's mercy with the Lord. You stop and think about it. Abraham was called a Syrian. He wasn't a Jew. That's where Paul reminded the Jews that even in the beginning, because they kept saying, well, we have Abraham as our father. Well, Abraham wasn't born a Jew. He was born a Syrian. He was on his face before idolatrous God when, when God called him out of the land of Ur, the Chaldees, and brought him into that land of promise. So in all this, there's mercy. Hosea that we're reading about is an example. Though all the land was caught up with idolatry, here was one of the Lord's that he'd spared like a fire ran out of the fire. And we can identify with that if we're the Lord's because we know that we are what we are by God's grace alone. Otherwise, we'd be right there with the worst of them. So here in the ninth and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, began Menahem, the son of Gabi, to reign over Israel and reign ten years in Samaria. Well, there's ten years versus one month with Shalom. And some may have begun to think, well, all right, the Lord's blessing is on him because look, he's lasted 10 years and over here, one month and he's gone. But here's what we read. This is why longevity in any kind of false worship is not an indication of salvation or of, of grace. How many people put that up to us? Well, I've been attending this congregation. In fact, my parents attended it. My, my grandparents, longevity is what they look at and they think, Thumbs up on that. And yet, verse 18 could be the testimony of any one of these that today follows after these professions and preachers. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, who made Israel to sin. So if you're following that, line all the way back up where it started at Jeroboam here is Solomon's servant that determined to take a people into false worship and worship the golden calf. And it's saying that this here, this king here, Menahem, like all the others, they departed not all their days from the sins of Jeroboam. In other words, they continued to propagate the false worship which is nothing but idolatry. Now here's where we see then already in this Menahem, a parting away even further. You say, well, how do you know, how do you recognize decline or apostasy? Well, the thing about Menahem here is that he leaned upon the arm of the flesh where you see people trusting in or seeking peace with anybody that professes to be the Lord's, beware. And that's what would be the testimony here of this Menahem, because it says in Pool, the king of Assyria came against the land. This is the Lord now beginning the first rumblings of what he would do. He didn't immediately take these out by Assyria, but he brings warnings and yet he raises up the king to come into the land. And as I said, the way Assyria worked, even like the Babylonians, they would take out the strong out of the land. By that, they would weaken some of the men, the leaders, and they would leave the women and children defenseless. That was part of their strategy. And so as they began to come against the land, look at Menahem. It said, this is part of doing evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not for that cry unto the Lord, nor did it even come to his mind that where he was at this particular time in his idolatry was just as evil as these nations that the Lord was bringing against them. 
And what did he do? Tried to bribe him and did. It says, and Menahem gave Pool a thousand talents of silver that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. That's a sign of apostasy when men will lean upon the arm of the flesh and seek to buy their salvation at the hand of the enemy. And it says that Menahem, not only did he make this offer with the king of Assyria, but now he exacted the money of Israel. Even all the mighty men of wealth of each man, 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. What's that but works? To try to get everybody involved in giving. <laughs> this isn't anything new when you hear these preachers using giving as a tax. They call it the tithe, but it's a tax upon the people to somehow get the work of the Lord done. Well, I'll tell you what, they take that money and use it for is not the work of the Lord. You could stop all of these projects and mission endeavors, so-called, that are going on around the world, and you wouldn't have affected the work of the Lord one whit as far as the gospel's concerned. It's just all being supported by on the backs of people that, that are made to believe that if they'll just give, and boy, the preachers are ready to crack that 10 prong whip over them, to give, and they're making them count how they're giving, and their tithe, and all these things, in order to somehow gain God's blessing. That's what he's thinking. If, if we can just support this, we'll be safe. And here's the deception, because verse 20 says, so the king of Assyria, turned back and stayed not in their land. So in their minds, and God uses this sort of deception, they're thinking, ah, so that's the thing. Every time the danger rises, we're just going to get more people to give. Give, give, give. And it says the rest of the acts of Manah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And again, you can go over there and read that at your leisure. But that's the story of Menachem. And it's part of the, the decline and death of the nation. Even as these are being raised up, there was no turning to the Lord. It was just biding time like dead men walking till ultimately the Lord would destroy them. Now, here's where we come to another king that was raised up, Pekahiah. It says that Menahem slept with his fathers and Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his stead. As goes the father, so goes the son. Unless the Lord's pleased to, to break that chain, most will follow in the footsteps of their fathers, even though they're false preachers. We see that all the time. These preachers that have built up ministries in their name and as they get old and decrepit and, and die off, who typically takes their place? It's their sons and their daughters. They're even putting their daughters in there. And here was Pekahiah. So you say, well, what, what was distinctive about Pekahiah in how he directed the people away from God? As I said, Menahem was leaning on the, the arm of the flesh and using basically bribery, using money, thinking somehow that he was bribing his way to security and safety. Well, I've heard preachers preach that way. If you just give your tithe, you can be sure of, of God's blessing on you. And that's the blindness. So they give. They give because the preachers exact it from them. And yet they're condemned. Here with Pekahiah is simply following in the footsteps of men. When it says here in Pekahiah, his son reigned in his stead. I'll tell you, when the Lord is pleased to separate out any one of his own and uh, there's a divide in the family, that's not anybody that can do that. I've experienced that with my family. I remember as the Lord first began to work in my heart, the divide came within my family, with my dad and my mom and all of these others that I've been, they've been associated with. They keep trying to pull you back. And, and yet, when the Lord's separating you out, he's separating you out. 
The Lord said that unless a man renounce himself and his father and mother and brother and sister, he cannot be my disciple. But what is the evidence of this decline and ultimately the death of a nation? It's when men follow men. They build on the foundation of other men, of those that have gone before them. That's important to them. So here it says in the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, we're getting down, that, that's Uzziah. Remember, he reigned for 52 years. So when you look at the parallel, even Azariah or Uzziah, it was coming up time when he would be lifted up in pride and go enter into that the temple and lay his hand upon that altar as if he could do it and didn't need a priest. And God struck him with leprosy. But it's about that time that this Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel in Samaria and what? Reigned two years. So we've seen all different types of reigns. That's by God's determining. The fact that one person lives longer than another, that's by God's determining. That's all been determined beforehand. And he did that which was, you know, as you read along, you keep kind of waiting for the good word, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But of all the kings of Israel, down this one line here, those 10 tribes, there's not one of them that's ever been named as a good king. They followed in the footsteps of their forefathers. There's that old hymn we used to sing, faith of our fathers. There's no faith to be founded on any fathers. The only true faith is that which is founded upon Christ. And there's a whole long line of so-called fathers that people follow after. Early church fathers and all these, the reformed fathers, they're all citing these men as men and that is their condemnation. Boy, if you want to see them get upset, just say that to them, that that's not the foundation. There's only one foundation that has ever been laid, and that is Jesus Christ himself. And so he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. It's an evil to follow men. That's an evil. That's part of that decline where men have their eyes on men and not upon the Lord. And it says he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebai, who made Israel a sin. What sins again? It's that sin of idolatry. It's all summed up in that. But Pekah, the son of Remaliah, a captain of his. So here's Pekaliah that was raised up. And he reigned in the stead of his father. But now we see a break because normally it's his son taking over from the father. Here, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the captain of his army, of Pekaliah, the king, conspired against him. How many times has that been written? This is why we don't want the Lord to leave us to our own judgment, because we would easily be conspired against and destroyed. Such was the deception even here that while Bechaliah was shoring up his reign, although still an idolater, here the Lord was purposing that his captain be conspiring against him and smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house. Such is the deception even of our own condemnation that were it not for the grace of God keeping us in Christ, we would be of this number smitten within our own house. It says with Argob and Uriah and with him 50 men of the Gileadites. This was quite a plot. And he killed him and reigned in his room. And so the rest of the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. So even thinking themselves safe. And I think about so many that have this false assurance that somehow the Lord's, even in their false ways and false worship and idolatry and self-praise and all, yet they will die as they've lived right there in that house that seemingly for them was a place of peace and comfort, and yet it wasn't. 
And so here it is in verse 27 now, in the two and 50th year of Azariah. Does that ring a bell? 52nd year. So you're over on this one side with the kings of Israel. The Lord's raised up this Pekah would be his name. You got Pekahiah and then you got Pekah. But it's at the same time or year that the Lord would strike Azariah, king of Judah, with leprosy. But it was in his 52nd year that he began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and what? Reign 20 years. So there again, people look at it and think, ah, well, then the Lord was blessing him. No, not necessarily. I think about Abel and Cain, where Cain said that the burden was too great for him, and in essence begged God to give him a, a long life, and God did, but it was only for the condemnation of his soul. Never granted him repentance. Same with Esau. It was Cain or Esau that lived long lives, and yet their end was certain. That decline toward destruction actually begins from birth. We don't realize it necessarily, but when children are born, they're born with a death sentence, unless Christ has paid their debt. But here he reigned for 20 years. And again, what? He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's all a sinner can do when left to themselves. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, who made Israel sin. You suppose there's a reason why the Lord continues to repeat that and repeat it? What's the issue? It's idolatry. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. Again, warnings. We're just 20, less than 20 years off now from this nation being completely destroyed to such a degree that people talk about the 10 lost tribes of Israel. They're gone forever, such as the destruction. But it didn't immediately happen. All of this that we've been reading took place over hundreds of years. But it had an end. It's coming to that end. And in those days, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, took I, John, and Abel, Beth, Maka and Janoa and Kadesh and Azor and Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. These are all places where the people that lived in them, it's like in remote places, felt a certain safety and protection. Even looking to their government, thinking, oh, that our king's going to take care of us, and yet carried them captive to Assyria. And Hoshea the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah. And he and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. So he reigned, it says up there, for 20 years. Remember, Uzziah had already died. It was Jotham that took Uzziah's place. So during that whole 20 years, in the 20th year, of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, that's when this Pekah was destroyed. It says the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. We're going to stop there for now because we do get into some other parts of this story that I believe we need to come back to, verse 32 down to verse 38. But for today, we'll stop here in verse 31. And uh, we begin there in verse 16. A lot to ponder. Not only of God's judgments, but of his mercy. Else we would be of their number.